what better place than to talk about incredible jewelry that in many ways represents trade, politics, geopolitics, and the world of the Maharajas, of emperors and empresses, and of course, uh, the continuous movement of the Wheel of Fortune. Thank you both for being here in this absolutely beautiful setting. And the way we're going to structure today's uh, short conversation is I'm going to ask an opening question, then let them both get on with it, because they've done a, a lovely session together, and then come back at the end to look at some of the history around what we're talking about. And then tomorrow, uh, we will follow this up again with another uh, conversation around um, uh, around uh, uh, how what's our conversation tomorrow? I forget. Uh, around sustainable luxury. Sorry, sometimes I forget. But just to begin with, and before that, I hope you're going to be writing a book or a memoir about the great Maharani's of of Baroda, and each of them were quite something in terms of what they did and how they sort of cracked the glass ceiling, as we've seen. And I hope at some point of time this is a work uh, that you will present and we'll have you at Jaipur uh, talking about it later. Uh, but Francesca, the 90th birthday of your grandfather and uh, picks you up at Nice, as he regularly does. You all go off to his wonderful uh, mountain uh, home, which is your home, uh, primarily because he's got lung problems like his uh, father as well. And um, on the 90th birthday, he loves giving you all gifts rather than, uh, you know, uh, receiving gifts. And he said to you, go find this particular bottle of vintage champagne uh, in the basement. And what happens? That's right. Um, so he, he said, yes, I've been saving a special bottle of champagne for us all to enjoy together. All the family was there to celebrate. Um, and so I left the, the breakfast on the, on the terrace and went down to the cellar to find this champagne to bring it up. And I just couldn't find it. And I really didn't want to disappoint him. It was his birthday. And I looked around everywhere in the cellar, which was full of everything, because Grandpa never threw anything away, but, but, but no champagne bottle. And just as I was leaving, I saw a, a box in the corner covered with or covered with old newspaper and, and a few other random things. And I thought, well, maybe the champagne's in there. And I moved off the old newspaper, and I saw that it was a leather trunk with the initials JC. Now, those are the initials of my great-grandfather, Jacques Cartier. And at this stage, I thought, OK, the champagne's probably not in here. But my curiosity had got the better of me. So very carefully, I opened this trunk, which obviously hadn't been opened for what seemed like decades. The straps were very fragile. And I opened it, and inside I was confronted with hundreds of letters. And they basically dated back to the mid-19th century, and they told the story of my family and the firm it had founded. So my grandfather was the last of the Cartiers to manage a branch of the firm. He managed the London branch until he retired in the 1970s, and it was sold at that point. And at that point when he retired, as Sandro said, he moved to the south of France, up in the hills, for, where the air was fresher for his lungs. And when he moved, a lot of things had been lost in the move. And he thought this trunk had been lost in the move, but he hadn't seen it for 40 years. Anyway, I was able to, I went up to him and I said, I don't have the champagne bottle, but I did find this. And he was overwhelmed because inside were letters from his par parents, his grandparents, his uncles. And over the following week that I was there, we, we went through the letters together and I realized this was the most incredible story and it deserved to be told and to be researched properly. And um, it was a story of jewels, of course, but for me, what, what became really interesting is that it was also the story of, of history, as Sandra referred to in the introduction, because the history of jewels is really the history of wealth, of economies, of power. You know, you, have a, you may have a grand duchess with an emerald necklace in, in a St. Petersburg palace, but when the revolution hits, she's forced to flee. And, you know, what does she take? She takes the jewels. She then sells them back to Cartier in the 1920s, who sells it to who's the wealthy person at that time. It's an American heiress in 1920s Manhattan. Then the Great Depression hits. What happens? The heiress has to sell it. It goes back to Cartier and then goes to a Maharaja in India. So you follow the same jewel around the world and, and you, you follow yeah, the story of, um, it's a story of wealth, of, of wars, of revolutions. And that really fascinated me. But also the idea that, that this history of, of jewelry and of, of Cartier is a history, it's a story really of, of relationships. And the relationships between my ancestors and their employees, there was a great 
mutual respect and admiration, but also between them and their clients, including, of course, the Maharajas of India. And in that trunk of letters, there were also many of my great-grandfather's diaries. And he traveled a lot to India because he, he managed the London branch, and with the London branch came responsibility for the colonies at that stage, the most important of which was India. So this is a couple of pages from his diaries here. And I literally used his diaries as a travel book. And I went around India trying to follow in his footsteps. Um, and there are some images of me in different places on the left. And I went to the same temples I saw. You know, he'd done little sketches in, in his diary of shapes of, temp of the temples. And I, I saw then the temples in their reality. And I saw how certain jewels had been inspired by these places he'd been. And I went to meet gem dealers. and. Um, and I also went to go meet the, the descendants of some of his clients. So um, I first met Radhika a few years ago. We were both giving a talk in Mumbai, weren't we? And I messaged Radhika just before saying, you know, out of the blue, <laughs> um, um, saying, you know, I'm coming, I'm researching my great grandfather, it'd be lovely to meet. And she incredibly generously invited me to Baroda. And it was wonderful and the start of a friendship um, that has endured. And with that, I thought I would pass over for Radhika to. Explore. This is where I met Radhika. It was the most mind-blowing place, four times the size of Buckingham Palace, apparently, Baroda Palace. But with that, I will pass over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sanjoy, and thank you, Francesca. Yeah, that's, uh, that's my home, and uh, the residents of it are here. My husband, my two girls, mm -hmm. only my mother-in-law, and our two dogs are missing. So that constitutes the entire population of this house of about 200 rooms. Mm -hmm. So it is perhaps the largest private residence in the world, and uh, uh, there is an entire book which this uh, <laughs> this palace could merit. But uh, it's in Baroda, and uh, that's where Francesca came and visited, and we made some discoveries. You'll have to click again. There we are. Yeah, that's just an introduction to the family that resides there. It's one of the, you know, the, this is our entrance, and that's Padmaja Narayani, my two girls, and Samajit there. You can wave. They're right behind there, so. <laughs> um, so one of the places Jack went on his trips to India was, was Baroda Palace, so it's very special. And he'd written about this all in his diary and his impressions of it and how he was blown away by the architecture and the art and just the way it had been designed and the courtyards and the water, and it was, so it was particularly magical to, to go there and experience it. So just as a brief introduction of, to Jack, this is... Jack, my great-grandfather, on the left is 175 New Bond Street. He moved Cartier, London, to there in 1909. And as I say, his responsibility included the Indian clients. And he went out there very regularly to India. And um, he grew to really love the country and the people. This is one of the this big, bright, tutti frutti bon um, Bondo is one of the pieces that obviously was inspired by India that I'll touch on a bit, a bit in a minute. But first of all, I wanted to just pass over to Radhika again, because he went, first of all, in the reason he went on his first trip was for the Delhi Durbar in 1911. This was a big celebration in Delhi, obviously, to, to celebrate the coronation of the new king. And he went because he knew all the, all the, Maharaj, all the Maharajas would be there. And so it'd be a great opportunity to meet as many as he, many as he could in one place. And um, one of the ones he, one of the Maharajas he met was, was Baroda. And I thought I'd yeah, pass over to Radhika to explain this here, because this is a little video of, of what happened at the coronation. <laughs> oh, sorry, the, the Durbar. So just to give a, a brief uh, before this, what happened was uh, 1911, uh, Princess Indira Rajay, the Princess of Baroda, was engaged to be married to the uh, His Highness of Gwalior. And therefore, these trips and rekis had been made to the jewelry houses of, um, of Cartier and Bulgari and Mubasan and, uh, and Shomi. And, there was obviously a meeting that had occurred between Maharani Jimnabai and Jacques Cartier, and uh, so he was invited to come for the Darbar. And this is a very important video uh, of the Darbar of Maharaja Sahaja Rao, because it created quite a stir. Usually the Maharaja is expected to wear jewelry, and it's a given, um, because it is a really, um, it's not merely an embellishment, it is um, a symbol of power and prestige and medals of honor and victory and so on and so forth. But here, uh, the Maharaja, Sayaji Rao, makes a very, very important statement by the absence of jewelry. So he's actually protesting 
this whole fanfare and this obeisance that the Maharajas are meant to be paying to King George and Queen Mary. So the absence of jewelry actually is making the statement more than any jewelry could have at that point of time. You can see he's in an absolutely austere white uh, angarkha, and he turns his back to the to the king, to the emperor. So, and that's meant to be a sign. Well, people inferred that off, as being off, yes. absolutely. Back, you back off. Yes. So, um, and on the right, we've got a Cartier pocket watch, and this is quite interesting. When Jack first went to India, he took with him suitcases of jewels to sell, but he took tiaras and devant de corsage and necklaces for women, and he gets there, and he was like, oh, this, the women aren't buying the jewelry here, it's the men, and they're not buying for the women, they're buying for themselves, so I brought totally the wrong things, and he's like, the biggest order he gets in, in India is for pocket watches, because all the men want the pocket watch that's fashionable in Paris at the time. And this is a particular pocket watch, um, beautiful enamel and diamond pocket watch, that was sold in an auction recently, and, and it was said that it, it was made for a different Maharaja. I think it was Kapertala they mentioned in the auction catalogue. But actually, it doesn't have the Kapertala crest on it. It's got the Baroda crest, which was really interesting, so it's another link between the families. So after the Durbar, I'm just going to forward, yeah. After the Durbar, the first place Jack goes is Baroda, and... He writes in his diaries about how he enjoyed meeting the Maharaja and a Maharani, and he talks particularly of the Maharani being a, an intelligent, superior woman. Um, and I thought that was that was quite interesting at the time. And she she asks him to look at their crown jewels because he, she said, "Look, we're thinking of having them reset, maybe in the Parisi in more of a Parisian style. Will you take a look at them and come up with some suggestions for the redesign?" So he goes to look at these jewels and he sketches many of them and he is just blown away. He has never seen jewels like these jewels in Baroda. Um, he said they're the most extraordinary pearls. He loves pearls and he spends time in the Persian Gulf buying pearls and he said these are the most this is the most extraordinary pearl necklace he has ever seen, perfectly matched and graduated. And, I, and speaking to Radhika, I realized that the, between Baroda, there's a bit special link with pearls. It was their the special gem. Yes, so um, the uh, Baroda had a preference for pearls, so of course they had the important diamonds, but you know they were very understated in their taste, and uh, pearls were preferred. There is documentation showing how Queen Mary in the Darbar, Dili Darbar, was was very impressed by by Mahani Chimnabai and her subtle way of dressing compared to all the other Maharani's who were really wearing um, you know all their best. And also to say uh, the pearl carpet from Baroda, which is encrusted with uh, precious diamonds and jewels, now sits in uh, the uh, uh, Qatar National Museum, uh, which was newly opened, and it's one of the most incredible pieces uh, to see there. Um, yeah. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this was, uh, as we know, that the Mughals were uh, the greatest proprietors of pearls. It's through the, you know, from 1500 to 1700 in the Mughal Empire, the finest and the best pearls were coming to India where they were fetching a higher price than even London. And uh, so the Maratha taste and uh, craftsmanship uh, continued from where the uh, Mughals left off. And this, these are entirely made in Baroda, um, but in the very Mughal style of, uh, of And if you see, this is not a weave, this is pearl. Yeah, uh, so there it's are 2.2 million uh, beads in it. It's got 30,000 carats of diamonds. It's got uncountable basra pearls and sapphires and rubies and so on and so forth. And it's all on calf skin. It's, um, there, it's really exquisite craftsmanship. It um, took two years to make. It was made uh, to be carried in the procession from Mecca to Medina and finally be put on the, um, the uh, tomb of uh, the prophet. But uh, unfortunately, the Maharaja, Maharaja Khandera passed away before it was ready, and so it continued to stay in the family's possession. And as well as the pearls, there are fantastic other uh, gems as well, which we won't go into detail, but just to give you an idea of the scale, this incredible diamond necklace, which, again, it's, it's the men wearing the big jewels. Um, yeah, it was always the men wearing the big jewels, and obviously it was because they were the they were the they held the treasury, so they could uh, make the commissions. Uh, they were the ones who were traveling. They were um, 
you know, sitting for portraits, meeting with other Maharajas. So they were the decision makers. Um, also, we, you know, Maharaja could have multiple wives, so it was not <laughs> very, very judicious if, if the Maharaja got all his wives, multiple wives, jewels like this. So it was usually so of course the is this is this generation that's now changed all of that, is it? It's reversed who's wearing the jewelry and how many wives as well. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> uh, he, he's sort of looking down and refusing to even <laughs> acknowledge the statement. Um, and this was just quite a fun moment. So when I was in Baroda with Radhika, um, I think we were just at lunch, and I was showing her some of Jack's diaries, and it was really fun to um, look at, you know, he was writing, he'd written basically 100 years earlier when he was in Baroda, and his sketches at that time of the jewels he'd seen. And this is one of the sketches he'd done, and, and Radhika said, oh, I recognize that jewel, <laughs> and was instantly, just from his rough sketch, able to show me which jewel it was, which was um, a turban ornament, right? Yeah, it was a... It it is a beautiful ornament, yeah. and um, and it was it was fantastic to see a sketch like that because obviously there was no photography at that time as we know it. So Jacques had actually sketched this, and he had done a very very accurate uh, sketch of it. And this was a commission. There were I think about um, two dozen sketches that uh, Cartier made over two trips to to the Maharaja, and it used to be long and laborious because you would come see the stones, then you would sketch them. Uh, then you would go back, you know, redesign them. Then you would, you know, come back, and if they're approved, then you would collect the stones or the old gems, and uh, then finally, you know, at some point, those the ready pieces would come, and there are stories and instances where, you know, things have come but they've come damaged or did not fit. So there would be a lot of back and forth. So a piece, uh, maybe commissioned, but it would take a long time to get ready. But in this case, the commission fell through. The Maharani was very keen that these uh, pieces be redesigned and reset by Cartier. But the local jewels, the family Baroda jewelers, they had an issue. They thought that you know this European brand would not understand the importance of these stones and the whole, you know, uh, you know because of stones in India, they have a completely different connotation from the astrological point of view and what suit you and the whole prestige um, of the stones. Some of them have been won through wars and marital alliances and so on and so forth. So um, they were very, very hesitant that this commission should go to a European house. So it fell through at that point. Yes, Jack was forced to leave Baroda with, without the commission. Um, but he kept traveling around India on that trip and many other trips, and he would buy gemstones. And he would often, this picture of him in Delhi looking at different gemstones, but he would often buy, he, he loved the Indian stones, the Indian carvings on stones. He loved the historical stones. He had a real admiration for them and, um, and, and respect for the Indian culture. He writes about that in his diary. He, he loves India. And he, he reads so much about it, about the history, the culture, the costume, his, his library, which passed down to my grandfather, still have, is full of books on India. And so he, he buys these stones and he brings them back to the West. And he, when he first arrives back in 1912, he puts on an exhibition in, in Cartier, London, including some of the pieces he's bought in India, because he wants to share with his Western clients this, this wonderful, um, you know, the, the history and the culture, but also the, 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 the quality of these gems. And this is the invitation for, for one of the exhibitions they, they hold in the West when they come back with some of these Indian pieces. But also, I thought it's quite interesting to show this is a piece made with obviously carved Indian emeralds that is made, um, this one is actually bought by Marjorie Merriweather Post, an American heiress. So even though it's being made, it turns out, for a Western audience, he's still true to the Indian culture in a way. He's not, he, he's, he's doing it in a way he's using Indian motifs, shapes. Um, he's, he's trying to stay true to the culture. We had a talk about that before, didn't we? About um, how that's perhaps why the Indian rulers trusted him with their gems. Absolutely. The fact that they were recommissioning, um, you know, their old stones um, to uh, Cartier repeatedly uh, indicated that they were happy with the, 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 the way the stones were being used, the importance and the caritage of the stones were not being compromised. And as you can see here, there's beautifully engraved 
uh, you know, stones. And uh, he's really celebrating the color and the luminance and the, and the style and the cut. He's not refaceted them in any way. So uh, that was the beauty of Cartier. And Cartier was not a label at that point of time. Cartier became a label as, uh, you know, they continued to make important jewels for important families. So this is very much in the nascent stage. But they were just, the Indian royalty were just very happy with how they were designing and, and uh, resetting these beautiful old stones. Yeah, and I thought that was just interesting, that conversation between East and West and sharing ideas and the fact that Jack's being so inspired, Cartier's being so inspired by India and bringing that back to London or America. And here you have some Western clients wearing Indian-inspired jewels, which, you know, then all the press picks up on it and Vogue says there's this great rage for Indian jewels at the moment. They're in all the best being worn by all the most important people in all the best parties in London, Paris, and New York. Of course, also the what's become known as the Tutti Futi jewels is Jack talks about the colors in India being so overwhelming. He says like everything is like a painting. It's so bright you can't even imagine. And that's what he's trying to um, mimic in a way in some of these jewels by putting emeralds, rubies, sapphires together, carved stones together, um, making that powerful effect. This is Daisy Fellows. Uh, um, wearing the, the famous collier and do on, on the left from the 1930s. So it was it really, it was kind of rebellious and bold for the time um, and, and became very popular. And these pieces today go for <laughs> crazy sums at auction. Um, so it's still popular 100 years on. So Jack continued to travel to India. Um, this is him in the 1930s with my great grandmother. This is in the palace of Nawanagar. Um, um, he was very close to the Maharaja of Nuanagar, Ranji, um, and I will show in the next slide, him and Ranji loved, both loved gems, and he made some of his most pieces he was most proud of for, for Ranji. Um, but this is, um, we were talking about this, this is Princess Harshad, wasn't it? It was a little five-year-old. This is Princess uh, Harshad Kumari, who just passed away uh, maybe six weeks ago. In, in Jamnagar, and you know, she's one of the most amazing women and continued to do a lot of work around built heritage uh, and education. Yeah, and I had wonderful conversations with her, and she remembered my great grandparents. She called them Aunt Jack and Aunt Nellie, and she remembered this party, and she remembers how they used to come and visit, um, which is so special for me. It's that kind of conversation continues through the years. But um, this is the Maharaja of Jamnagar. Actually, this is his nephew wearing the necklace because after he had it made, Ranji, he then died just a, a couple, three years later. But I thought this brings us on to another interesting topic is that some of these, these beautiful old pieces, this is one of the necklaces Jack was most proud of creating, that this diamond necklace, and it apparently had the, a cascade of colored diamonds unrivaled in the world. Um, and you can see the sketch for it on the left, an incredible piece. But this was used as the inspiration for a necklace in um, one of, I think it's Ocean's Eight, one of the, uh, the films, this is Anne Hathaway wearing it here. Um, it was actually referred to at that time as a, in the film, as the Jean Toussaint necklace. Jean Toussaint was a female designer in Paris in, in the 1930s, not designer, sorry, creative director of Paris in the 1930s. Um, in fact, she didn't have anything to do with this necklace. It was designed by Jack. But, um, but it was just interesting that these old pieces continue to be, you know, have that magic attached to them in a way. It was a kind of... Uh, it was a, I think there was a robbery, and this, this was a necklace that was stolen. A bit like kind of the idea of Fabergé egg. And this is another of the old pieces that has appeared today. Um, this is the Maharaja of Patiala. So the Maharaja of Patiala, Bhupinder Singh, um, this isn't Bhupinder Singh, this is his son, kind of interesting, but his, his father went into Paris in the 90, Cartier Paris in the 1920s um, with literally a case of jewels all wrapped up in different newspaper in little scraps of newspaper and essentially put it in, 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 in front of the Cartier salesman. I actually spoke to the salesman's grandchildren who, who told me this over lunch. They told them they, they said, you know my grandfather told us he was, they, he was asked to open this trunk and inside the trunk were all these bits of newspaper and their grandfather, the salesman was very confused and were like, what's this? And the Maharaja said, open them. And as he opened each little bit of newspaper, another gem fell out. One was a ruby as big as his thumbnail. There were diamonds, there were emeralds. And the Maharaja said, you know, take it. And the salesman said, well, no, I've got to kind of um, itemize each piece. And he said, no, no, don't be, you know, I don't have time for that. You know, he totally trusted Cartier. He's like, just take it and, you know, do something with it. And this commission took three years, and Cartier created amazing pieces, which they would then display in their, in their Rue de la Paix um, showroom. 
um, which I think is quite an interesting topic as well. It's obviously the day bef way before the internet and, and influencers, but in a way Cartier were using the fact that they were creating jewels for the Maharaja to, to boost their own credibility and it kind of worked both ways really. But this necklace, the big bib necklace, turned up in an antique market in, or an antique store in London in the 1980s without the big gems, without the diamonds in it. And Cartier bought it back and remade it with synthetic diamonds. And it's appeared at a few exhibitions. But it was interesting to see the, um, the dog collar very recently, this was just a couple of weeks ago, at the Met Gala on this, this YouTuber, influencer, Emma Chamberlain. And um, it's kind of, it's led to a bit of controversy, hasn't it, in the press? Absolutely, and, it, and I'm happy to see it on <laughs> the collar on in someone's neck rather than in a vault somewhere unknown. But uh, it's a very important uh, story that needs to be narrated, you know. Um, the, the piece itself, you know, there's a lot of thought that go went into designing these pieces, the stones that were used, they all have a history and story. So, you know, it's really literally taking it out of context and putting it. So it needs all the attention it's getting, but the story is as sacred as the piece itself for me. Yeah. And this is another example of some of the old jewels turning up more recently. This is um, the Raja of Mandi who perhaps inherited these, these emeralds from his father-in-law, the Maharaja of Kapertla. We're not sure, but we, we think that. And you could see it, this big necklace on him here in the left. And then these jewels turned up at Sotheby's quite recently, or a couple of years ago. But all the separate jewels and no reference to him. So they'd obviously been broken up over the years. Um, but it's quite fun to kind of, when you can spot these pieces and see how it, it was. And... Um, I whiz through this, but this is a uh, turban ornament that was made for the Maharaja of Kapertla in the 1920s. And I show this because this was an, an advertisement that Cartier put out at the time for the brow of a great prince. And it's again linking Cartier with a Maharaja. And you can see, and as I say, that, that they were influencers in a way. Cartier were, were using their link with the Maharaja, and the Maharaja was pleased for them to do that because it, he, wanted to be, he was very happy to be connected with Parisian society, which he valued highly. Um, so yes, it was just interesting that that theme that perhaps we think is new, the idea of influencers was, was going on 100 years ago in a different way. Um, and here he is wearing the turban ornament. Um, this is his page from the diary when he said he picked up the turban ornament in the 1920s and, and had his portrait painted um, with it. And we thought it was fun to show this because this is obviously a man wearing these fantastic emeralds um, in, in India, but then in the West, it's... This is so beautiful. It's, you know, similar stones, but so beautifully uh, applied for a woman's head. Um, I, I mean, that's the beauty of, of Cartier, that they were able to interpret similar stones, but, you know, keep the aesthetics alive as per, you know, the, the culture, which was Western here and vis-a-vis -vis Indian there, and the gender, and create masterpieces which were totally different to each other. These gems had a lot of life because these were the Roman of emeralds. So these would have been kind of twinkling in candlelight in the St. Petersburg Palace on Grand Duchess Vladimir, and then, then they were sold um, to a 1920s um, American heiress and sold to Barbara Hutton in the 1930s, who initially had them as a really chunky 1930s necklace, an earring set, and then later had them reset again by Cartier into this fantastic headpiece, which also could become a necklace. This was her in her palace in Tangier, photographed by Cecil Beaton. Um, yeah, incredible piece. And the, these are really interesting as well. These are now in the British Museum. Yeah, so this is Marni Gayatri Devi. Um, her mother was Princess of Baroda. And these are all beautiful pieces of jewelry that have come up um, anonymously in the British Museum. Um, they were, uh, of course, given by her uh, to the museum to be displayed post her demise. But it's, it just indicates how there has continued to be a drain of valued Indian treasures out of the country. Here, at least, we have the privilege of being able to buy a ticket and see it in a museum. But most of them have been broken, have been sold individually as stones. or um, So it's, it's continued to happen that way. And government policy hasn't really helped in uh, retaining and, um, and or returning these pieces back to the country. So this is some of those pieces which are now in the British Museum. Uh, Francesca, perhaps is the time that you should also, you know, when, 
when old pieces came back, the Cartiers actually bought them back and then repurposed them and it went on to the next person who owned it. Tell us a little bit about that story at this point of time. Yeah, well, that was a big part of the business. People would would come into Cartier to sell as much to buy. And sometimes it would be, you know, when it got past, lots of things happen. I said before, jewels are about personal relationships and you may get a gift when, when on a marriage, but then, you know, you, you have two children and you want to split it or, or sometimes you're forced to settle. The next generation is forced to settle. There's a divorce. So that was all very much part of, of the Cartier's business as well, was buying back the jewels and then, um, resetting it for, sometimes they had a client in mind, or sometimes they would reset it for an exhibition, um, and, and then, you know, selling on to, and the I think selling on to someone else, but I think one of the reasons, it's a really interesting point, and I think that the link between the East and West that Cartier had with the Maharajas, I think saved Cartier, because those 1930s was such a difficult time for a luxury firm after the, in the Great Depression, and, um, Cartier was diversified enough. It had those links in India where the Maharajas weren't affected in the same way and they were able to buy back. Um, I did a talk recently with um, Kieran McCarty, who's a creator of the Fabergé exhibition that's been on in London. And we were looking at, at the relationship between Cartier and Fabergé and, and the similarities and the differences. And I think one of the differences is that Fabergé weren't diversified. So when the Russian Revolution hit, that was it really for them. Whereas Cartier, they survived the Russian Revolution because they had France, and they survived two world wars, you know, the pandemics, the depression, because they had, because the Cartiers felt it was so important. I talked about that relationship thing. Paris was the center of the world in the early 20th century, right? Maharajas would come to Paris. American heiresses would come to Paris. You know, grand duchesses of Russia would come to Paris. The Cartiers didn't need to go to America, to India, to Russia, but they felt it was so important to go and to travel around. And often Jack found himself without proper transport. At one point in Patiala, he found himself with the only transport he could find was a donkey. <laughs> he said, after that, I'm bringing my Rolls Royce each time because this is getting ridiculous. So it was tough travels, you know, and it was three weeks on a boat there and then he traveled all the way around the country. He'd be away from his family for months. But they felt it was so important to build that personal relationship, uh, meeting them in their own homes. And that's what I think led to the loyalty and it led to those clients not only buying from Cartier, but trusting them when they wanted to sell back. Because as you say, it's not an easy thing to sell back. There's sometimes a bit of shame attached to that. You've inherited it from someone. You don't want to have to sell it. You don't want to be that your generation is the one that breaks the link with this jewel. But they knew with Cartier they could trust them and it would all be done discreetly. Uh, and, and, and also the three brothers sort of split the world between themselves. Yeah, so my, this was my grandfather's stories was that his father and two uncles, Louis, Pierre, and Jack, when they'd been little boys, they had taken a map of the world and they'd literally split it between them with a pencil. They said, we want to build the leading jewelry firm in the world and this is how we're going to do it. And so Louis was the elder brother, confident, you know, felt that it was his right to have the Paris headquarters. That, that's me. Pierre, the middle brother, said, I'll take New York. He'd seen a lot of the, the wealthy Americans coming to Paris and thought that was a good opportunity. And I don't think my great-grandfather Jack had much say in the matter. He got London, but, um, which is why I'm, why I'm British. But he also, with that, as I say, came responsibility for the colony, so it fell to him to travel to India. So I'm thrilled about that, because following in his footsteps, I got to go around there too, which is just magical. But yes, it was the idea of this, I think quite a, um, you know, a brave idea at that time, this idea of globalization before that was even a word. You know, it was risky to go and set up bases elsewhere when everyone else was coming to Paris. And I think they were the first of, th of the big French luxury jewelers to, to do that, but it paid off. And it wasn't just only jewelry. I mean, they did take, uh, initially there was lots of silver, there was uh, sculptures, there was bronzes, there was of course the watches. Well, yeah, in the 19th century, it was, it was works of art, curiosity, I found an advert, it's like curiosities, works of art and jewels. It, yes, you're right. And it was, uh, and in the early days, they didn't have a lot of money, so they would, they would buy what they could from other workshops or other people and, and sell it on. Yes, it wasn't like, they weren't making their own jewelry in the same way. It's, it's, yeah, that was the, the generation that they did that was the generation of the three brothers in the 20th century. Um, well, I thought it'd be great to, this is another of the piece that's in the British Museum, which is fabulous. Um, 
if any of you find yourself in London with a couple of hours to spare, recommend that. But but this brings us back to the idea of, of old, um, the old and new. And anyway, I'll pass over to Radhika for this story. So as you can see me in the red sari, um, I'm wearing a collar, but it was originally a tiara. And you can see a picture of it as it is worn on a model. So this was a stock piece bought by Mahani Chimnabai uh, from Cartier. And um, obviously, it was not worn. We don't have any family member wearing uh, it uh, in any photograph. So um, it lay there for the longest time. And it is that picture on the left, the black and white picture, is from our um, album. And it, it you know, states how many diamonds and rubies and you know, all the technical details. But there's no, um, there's no mention of the maker. So um, indicating that Cartier was, was obviously not, uh, I mean, the label was not important. It was the workmanship and the other technical details that were given importance. And uh, then this was given to me at my wedding. So I wore it, I've been wearing it as a necklace. And only recently have I had the, the <laughs> The, um, the courage to wear it actually as a TRI. So it's not, it doesn't sit very much like the original anymore because it's been, you know, it has been modified um, to, to fit in the neck. But it's, a, it's an exquisite piece and uh, it's a Cartier. Radhika, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what was the fascination by Marani Chanmabai when she actually was so possessed with, with uh, acquiring and remodeling some of these beautiful pieces uh, and the connection therefore then with uh, uh, Francesca's grandfather. So she was a very modern woman for a time. She was one of the first women in India to do away with the Parda system. She traveled independently abroad uh, with and without her husband. She made purchases in jewelry shops, um, um, you know, to her own merit. She, um, um, liaisoned with, with, uh, with jewelry brands, jewelry houses, with uh, dealers, uh, gemstone dealers. She clear, uh, closely uh, studied the market of, of these stones, of the value of gold, diamond, and would set, buy and resell as the market would fluctuate. So she was very, very uh, keenly following um, stones, not just for the, you know, their beauty, but also for the intrinsic value, their commercial value. and. Uh, I think because the women, like we were talking about, women in Baroda have been always been very strong and independent. She was taking those decisions. It was not entirely uh, in the hands of the men, you know. So, um, and she was also a great investor, and she yes, her baikata keeping of the accounts yes. was legendary. Absolutely, and uh, she was very sharp, and she would directly deal with the diwan or with the, uh, you know, with the uh, with the accounts department and pull them up, and it's, everything was very, very well documented. Yeah, I mean, Jack does talk about how she was the one who, like, the court were kind of looking to her for <laughs> instruction what to do, and everyone listened to her, and um, yeah, she was, sh she sounded like an amazing woman. Um, well, that kind of brings us to the end of our little talk, but I just thought it was interesting to show these photos of, you know, um, I think both of these would have been taken in the early 20th century. The photo of Jack on the left is certainly taken at the Delhi Durbar in 1911, where he's um, at a polo match. He's very excited that every afternoon there were polo matches. And in fact, at one of them, he said he sat next to Guy Quad of Baroda, and they watched the polo together and talked. And I think that's when he was invited to come to Baroda after the Durbar. Um, and then, um, obviously, pictures of, of us today and just how great it is that that conversation continues. You know, as, we've, as we know, hospitality uh, is an amazing thing, uh, as we've been experiencing here. One of the things that your great-grandfather talked about it, at, the, at the Paris showroom was that he had this wonderful uh, darwan or a guard who used to smile uh, like Santa Claus, almost like Santa Claus. Uh, Yes, no, that was, I mean, this was like one of the, so as I was reading the letters, I kind of several family mottos came, came out, you know, from repeatedly reading the letters between different generations of my family. And one of them that first came up in, I think, the 1870s was be very kind. So the founder, my great, great, great grandfather, he sent his son off to London in the 1870s. The 1870s were terrible in Paris. It was a siege of Paris war, everyone was starving in Paris, people were so hungry they were eating rats, you know, it was impossible to do any kind of business, let alone sell jewellery. So he said to his son that you go off to London and um, 
And that's what Alfred, his son, did. He took jewels from, from um, he bought jewels from Parisians desperate to sell and took them to, to London, to a population unaffected by, by, the, by the war, by the siege. And, and the letters that the two write to each other between in that time are really moving. And one of them is Louis Francois saying to his son Alfred, he said, be very kind to whoever you meet. You know, they're just starting out at this stage. They've got no money. They might be, you know, it's touch and go whether the business survives. But this is like one of the most important business lessons. Uh, my grandfather said that that had been so strong and had been passed down to him as well. And he said that his father had told him that to always have on Cartier London, they had a, a doorman who was the most s wonderful, smiley doorman. And the one that grandpa remembered was one who looked like Santa Claus, who was always smiling. And he said... You know, it was the idea of kind of be very kind. He was very respectful and polite to everyone who came in the door, but also just so friendly. And the idea that one doesn't buy jewellery if you're not feeling good. So, you know, make people feel happy and be kind to, to everyone, whether that be a client coming into the showroom or to, to your employees. And, yeah, as I said, the idea of relationships, I think that's so important in terms of what made the business successful. And tell us, again, going forward, in the 70s, when he actually decided to, uh, to close or to sell the firm on, and the heartache and the, and the debate that he had within himself in doing so. Yeah, I mean, that's a quite a big topic and maybe too big for <laughs> a couple of minutes, because there are so many different factors when you sell a business like that. And it was really hard for him, because he, his father had passed it down to him as the eldest son, and he felt like his father had felt, like his grandfather had felt. It was their duty to, to keep it going. But there were different factors at play. Most importantly, really, was that his two cousins, who had the London, I'm oh, sorry, who had the New York and the Paris branches, had sold their branches without telling him. So he'd found out later. And so he was, he was the only Cartier owning a Cartier store at that stage. And so... Cartier New York and Cartier Paris were doing different things. And he was still trying to do things the old-fashioned way. He was still making watches by hand, which meant that every part of a watch was made by hand. They took months to make. Um, and, and the New York branch weren't doing that. They had changed. They were, they were making many more tank watches and selling them at a much cheaper price. And that's a kind of unsustainable model when you've got two watches which kind of look roughly the same design. Both got Cartier on the dial, but are made entirely different ways, a different... Um, price points. Um, but also it was just a very hard time in London in, in the 1970s, I think, oil crisis and taxes were inordinately high on the luxury coal items. Coal strikes, yes. And also I think the world was changing and people didn't want to spend that much money on a piece of jewellery anymore. And people didn't have the opportunity to wear that ju those jewels. And I think the swinging 60s in London was a time of rebellion. It was a time of the young going out, rebelling against their parents, wearing mini skirts. They didn't want to wear the same diamond tiaras or pearl necklaces. So it was, you know, he had to, he, he would have had to adapt in quite a significant way, but given all the factors at play, I think he felt that, that it was the best. Also, when he sold, he hoped that he would be selling back and that the Cartier branches would be reunited again. So at least he'd be true to the family in that way, that the name would stay alive, which is what happened. So. And today, of course, you know, fast forwarding to one of, one, of the th one of the principles that the Cartier brothers had is they were always very clear about the provenance of where the gems came from. And uh, if you look at today uh, in any of the auctions, one of the biggest thing is, of course, blood diamonds or where do these pieces yeah. come from and, and in whose hands have they traveled through? I mean, you know, because it's sold again and again. And in many times, it's not just about selling. It's also about the way it's got there. Do you have, a, do you have an opinion on, on how jewelry today is traded, which is very different from the way that it was traded uh, all the way till the 70s? Yes. I mean, I, I think, well, for me, the, the interesting thing about, I didn't, I didn't come from a jewelry background. Yes, I was born into the Cartier family, but I... I didn't and she's a literature student, so she's not even a historian. <laughs> and then I worked in finance, so totally unrelated. But what I did find interesting about the jewels is the story of, of the people, of the hands it's travelled through. So personally, I think that adds a lot of, of value to the piece. But it, it, is, it is tricky territory because, as, as we were talking about before, sometimes people sell not wanting to sell or sell quietly and then... People assume pieces have been stolen or taken from one culture to another culture. And 
Is that right? I mean, it's a. I don't know what you think, Radhika, about it, but it's a. I, th I think most old important stones have bloody history. You know, whether it's the Kohinoor or, or mo most stones, because they've changed hands. In the case of Baroda itself, the Akbar Shahi, it was um, the, it, the Mughal Golconda diamond was uh, was part of the the you know the um, the peacock throne of the, the Emperor of India, and which was pillaged by Nadir Shah and then found its way all the way back to India into the Baroda wars. So these stones have a history. They are all been coveted. People who want jewelry, follow jewelry, are always waiting to get their hands on them. And history has been violent. So stones look beautiful, but there is a <laughs> lot of violence sometimes involved. Let's open it up to the audience, and then we'll come back a little bit to the astrology and what stones okay. mean. But any questions? Ingrid, go ahead. Hi. <laughs> yeah, it's on. Uh, this is to Francesca. Um, the jewelry is exquisite, and each of these pieces are just wonderful. Uh, I wonder if, in the letters and in the writings or conversations you heard from your uh, your ancestors about the other reasons why these pieces of jewelry were acquired by the royal houses or affluent families as a statement of status, as an expression of wealth, as a reassurance of the treasury? I mean, were there other aspects that came into play beyond the beauty of the stone and the piece of jewelry? Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I think I found that really interesting as well, because jewelry can be many things to many people. And it can be a way of saying, I love you, I, I'm sorry. It can be you know, a, a guilt thing, or um, on the birth of a child, or it can be, yes, a symbol of, of power. Um, and I think the, the power thing was important in, in many places, especially in the royal families in not just India, but as I say, in Russia and well, all over, really. And, it, and if a queen had a big tiara on, you weren't meant to outshine the queen. You know, it was, <laughs> you, you knew your place. Um, and I, there are so many interesting stories about what different jewels, what different jewels say about different people and how, I mean, there's one in, in I was looking at the British royal jewels, and in the same year, Cartier made a tea. They, well, the king, who ended up abdicating, asked Cartier to make an emerald, uh, an emerald engagement ring for him for, for Wallace Simpson. That was at the same time, around the same time, that Cartier was making a tiara for his younger brothers, his younger brother to give to, to give to his wife. So at the same time, Cartier was making two pieces for two members of the royal family. One of those pieces would cause the king to abdicate and the younger brother to become king. And you know, I, I wonder whether even the royal family knew what was going on at the time, and, and Cartier did. And you have these, you know, the different reasons for the jewels. One is a, a gift, and one is obviously a so symbolic, symbolic of 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 a man choosing love over love over the throne. So. No, absolutely, and I think that's what's so interesting. When you see that ring now, that ring subsequently been, was reset um, by the Duchess of Windsor and then appeared at auction. But I found that absolutely fascinating. It's a symbol of so much more than, it's not just an emerald. It wasn't just a gift of love. It was a symbol of, you know, it changed the royal line. That's why we have our queen today in England. And of, and of course, in India, jewelry's also got to do with your stars, that you have to wear, you know, whatever rati to ensure that your Jupiter or Saturn or Moon or whoever's transiting from wherever is, is sort of appeased because you are doing stony things with your jewels. Yeah, absolutely. So we don't see uh, sapphires because sapphires, firstly, blue is not really considered an auspicious color in India uh, for, you know, and therefore not really set in, um, you know, as an important jewelry. And sapphire itself is supposed to be a temperamental stone. It has to suit you. Uh, so, uh, the first time instance of us having sapphires in the collection was actually Sita Devi, um, and she uh, commissioned jewelry and sapphire. And then it was uh, 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 Marni Padmavati, the princess of Jodhpur, who was married to the late Maharaja, late, late Maharaja Pateh Singh of Baroda, who uh, she loved um, sapphires and aquamarines, and you see a lot of blue come in with her jewelry. But otherwise, yes, uh, you. They stayed away from uh, stones which were, um, were were not considered auspicious or not lucky for them. And there, there is, a, like I said, a preference for stones like like pearls. Pearls are meant to be cooling. They're you know 
good for your disposition and health. So you see those kind of stones. And the setting was also in a way that the, sc the stone touches your skin, you know, so that you get your maximum benefit out of it. So, And Francesca, was there ev any evidence that the Cartiers also made jewelry for, for the gods and goddesses in temples across, or was it only for, you know, human beings, I mean, Maharajas and their ilk? That's a good question. I haven't heard of them making for for anyone but human <laughs> beings, but, but unless one of their commissions was for that, maybe, I don't know. I don't no, know. Sanjay, we wouldn't because they were all set in gold. So, and the setting of, of Cartier was totally entirely different. So, it, they, they were all dressed in Indian uh, regalia and they all, but the, it was important that the setting of the stones was in gold. The God was always adorned in gold. A and the very fact that the stones had to go across the uh, you know, the, the sort of famed seas uh, where you shouldn't be crossing them. Uh, and then they used to come back. When they came back, uh, were they sort of purified and...? No, not in Baroda. But like I said, sometimes the setting, they would, you know, the fitting would not be correct or they would be damaged in, you know, through the travel. So there were a lot of uh, heartbreaks and, you know, returning and, and, you know, repairs and all that was happening. So to get a perfect piece, you know, that you're happy with um, took a lot of back and forth. It wasn't that you just order it over the phone. There was a lot of... Uh, one of the most poignant things, and we can end with this, Francesca, is that when the letters were discovered and you were able to match some of the letters and some of the information to the, to the people still working, who were working with your grandfather, and you, you were able to bring back clippings and their telephone numbers and so on and so forth, and this is, of course, pre-Facebook. Tell us yeah, that as a conclusion. It was, it, was, it was unexpectedly, yeah, an unexpected benefit. So I, finding the letters, I then spoke to my grandfather a lot, and I asked him about those who had worked with him. And I actually even had his old address book. So he'd lost contact with a lot of people when he'd moved to France. But I was able to track some of them down and speak to them. And I'm so grateful I did, because most of them have passed away now. I mean, my grandfather was 90 at that time. And, um, and hear their stories as well and share them with my grandfather and vice versa. But even after grandpa died, I mean, I'm still in touch with so many of these people. There's one craftsman who's... Um, in his 90s and he lives in London and I try and pop in whenever I can. And the first time he went, he said, I can't believe I've got Jean-Jacques' granddaughter in my front room. And then he told me all these stories about what it had been like and making pieces for the royal family and for the Maharajas and to hear it from his perspective. Because I thought that was so important to hear the story from as many people as possible, hence traveling around. Because the letters, although there are letters between a family, essentially they tell one side of the story. I wanted to hear from others. and. The overwhelming message I, I heard was that working at Cartier felt like working for a family. And also from the clients and the descendants of the clients, they had not only used Cartier as a jeweler, but they also often become friends with the Cartiers. And that has been, I mean, I've, I've rep reaped the rewards of that because I've been welcomed into people's houses all over the world as if I'm family, which has just been incredible. I feel like I've got this extended, yeah, extended family all over the world. So. But it wasn't until after your grandfather passed and some years after when you started listening to the recordings of, uh, of, that you had done with him that you actually got down to the book. Yes, well, I had the idea to write a book, but, I mean, the research can go on and on and on and on. <laughs> I mean, there are so many different parts of it, and I could write a book on just on the India link or the Russia or the... You know, there are so many different parts, but... Um, but then I thought I've got to just get on with, with writing this book. Um, and so I did. And at that point, I thought I should, because I'd recorded my grandfather's voice, his mem him speaking to me, often just over the lunch table, often with a baby crying in the background. Um, and it took me a long time to, be able to listen to those tapes. But it was wonderful when I did. And um, it was like he was, he was there with me on this journey. And no, very, very, I'm so pleased I did do, did do the recording. Very special. So if you really want, sorry, so you wanted a question. <coughs> Go ahead, so, uh, um, Mike. Uh, uh, how old was your grandfather when he sold the business, and did he die shortly after, or, or did he uh, live on? And um, what was his response to how the new owners took the business? Because it, it was clearly very much a family business. There was very strong values. And um, did that sort of undermine him, the, the changes? Um, uh, 
Well, I can't talk as to what happened after the sale because I wasn't even born there. I was, I was born a kind of a few years after the sale, and my talks of him really focused on the time when, when you know, he was in charge of Carte. That was a period I was interested in, and his, his father and his uncles. So I can't talk to so much about how the strategy changed afterwards. Um, more about how it impacted yes, but I can talk exactly, but I can talk about that. And that it was terribly hard. I think my mother said he went into kind of depression afterwards, and he didn't talk about it for many years. And he moved to France, and he, he didn't go back and visit Cartier. I think he felt he'd let, although he realized that, well, he felt that it was, it was the only thing he could really do, he also felt a sense of sadness and maybe even letting down the, the, the family for, for being the one to break that chain, even though his cousins had already sold. So I think it was really, really hard for him. And I think it took me finding the letters, and I was probably one generation removed, you know, I, I, sorry, I was one generation removed, I wasn't a, a child, I was a grandchild, and I was asking him questions about the letters, asking him to fill in the gaps, and it, he was quite, it was hard at the beginning to get him to open up, and then I would come back and see him, so I just had a baby, and I was like on maternity leave, and I remember arriving with my baby at like midnight, and he'd, in the south of France, and he'd have like, thought of all these stories when I'd been away and then we'd just sit at the kitchen table and he would like download for two hours until 2 a.m. So whereas at the beginning it had been hard to get him to open up, I think the more he thought back, the more he thought, gosh, if I don't tell her these stories, they're going to be gone. And these are stories. He wasn't so much talking about him because he was the most humble, modest man. He wouldn't think he should be included in anything. I did include quotes of his in the book because I wanted his voice to be like the heart of it, really. But he would t have to tell me stories about his father or grandfather or uncles, and he really wanted to, to, yeah, to keep them alive. Not, you know, if, if only just for me and for my children and the next generation, but I thought it was a story worth, worth sharing.